In 1957, a fisherman was coming in from a day on the ocean, hoping to outrun an approaching storm. As he cruised along Hinchinbrook Island, he saw a column of smoke and assumed it must be a village where he might find shelter. The man went ashore to investigate. But instead of finding sanctuary, he found a mystery. The village was there with an active fire going, but there was no one to be found. It was as if everyone had vanished. Suddenly, he saw a massive bear-like beast, which sent him racing back toward his boat. Was the bear real? Or the embodiment of an Inuit legend, the Torngasuk, or bear god? While some view this being as a protector, lore suggests it will unleash its wrath when displeased. Since then, the area has had seven more sightings of the beast, but no one from the town has ever been found. Inside the vast frontier of Alaska is a mysterious triangle, where each year, five out of every thousand people go missing. Three investigators look for answers. Jax, a former police officer. Ken, a specialist in strange phenomena. And Tommy, an expert on Alaskan legends. Together, they uncover mysterious sightings and ancient legends, exploring the possibilities of those who go Missing in Alaska. The team approaches Hinchinbrook Island in Prince William Sound. The abandoned town, believed to be a fishing village of about 70 people, was discovered near its southeast corner. Guys, what I don't get, I mean, we've investigated a lot of cases where we've had individuals disappear. We're talking about an entire village of people. I mean, what would cause an entire village to just vanish? It is really strange. I mean, for no bodies to be left there. Yeah, there's no record of any type of natural disaster, like an earthquake or a tsunami or anything like that volcano. The fisherman claims he's looking around, you know, sees this large white bear. You guys, we're talking about a, a village that presumably was pretty familiar and had lived with bears for a long time. You know, I think it's kind of a stretch to say that it's just, you know, a, a bear. If we're talking about a bear, we're talking about a bear that's big enough and bad enough and scary enough to cause an entire village to vanish. I mean, this sounds exactly like the Inuit legend of the Torngasuk, the bear god. The Torngasuk legend describes a giant white bear that can act as either protector or accuser. As the master of whales and seals, it was often invoked by fishermen for a successful outing, and even by shamans for the curing of illness. But some say it would prey viciously on those who disrespected nature. Now, what if we're just dealing with some sort of exceptional bear, you know? There's a lot of explanations, guys, before we get into, the, you know, a god bear or a demon bear. I think we got a lot further to go on this one before we come up with any kind of answers. Maybe there was a singular bear with a genetic quirk that allowed it to grow really large. Evolution allows for that sort of anomaly. One such anomaly has been found in cattle and other animals, a condition commonly known as double muscling. It's caused by a genetic mutation that inhibits the myostatin protein, which regulates muscle growth, resulting in larger, more powerful animals. If a bear had this condition, it might come across looking like a monster. The team arrives at the landing site where the fishermen pulled ashore 60 years ago. The reported location of the village is up in the woods. They remain vigilant, one sighting of this white bear was reported just two weeks ago by a hunter. Pretty dense brush out here. So would this white bear just be a polar bear? But this really makes sense down here. Maybe it's not a pure polar bear. They have crossbred with grizzlies. 
polar bears are the largest bears in the world, which makes them the largest carnivores on land. Males commonly reach 1,500 pounds and can get well over 2,000. But in Alaska, their range is limited to the north and northwest fringes of the state. However, crossbreeds of polar bears and grizzlies have been found in the wild. Could this have led to a white bear that's comfortable in warmer climates? Well, check this out, guys. Oh, yeah, look at that. We still got some structure standing. It's been a long time. Look at all that growth, Tommy. We got to look for signs of bear here, any paw marks, tracks, scratching the building. I agree. We need to be looking for everything, though, guys. I mean, we want to find out what happened to this village. The abandoned village has shades of another American mystery, the lost colony of Roanoke Island. Established in 1587, Roanoke was the first English colony in the New World. But when a supply ship showed up three years later, everyone had vanished. Theories ranged from an attack by hostile Spaniards to a failed relocation in search of resources. But these Alaskan natives were skilled survivalists and had no known enemies, limiting such theories. Careful now, there could be squatters or wild animals that aren't happy to see us. The village has been uninhabited for nearly 60 years, but relic hunters and other visitors have cleaned out most of it. We're clear, Tommy. Coming out. The team searches the sparse remains of the settlement. They know the odds of finding evidence this long after the incident are slim, but there could be traces of biological matter that offer some insight. I pull out my UV light, hoping that I might get lucky and find some old dried blood or something, but I'm not seeing anything. You guys seeing anything? Not yet. I'm just seeing a bunch of broken down buildings. There's a little creep back here. This place is falling apart here. We're clear here. OK, we're good to go, buddy. What's the plan? Let's search all around it, look for everything, you know? I mean, any signs we can find at all, you know, bears, people, blood, and some sign of what happened in this village. I think we need to check the perimeter of the village here. I agree. As the team widens their search, Ken breaks out a metal detector. If there are any shallow graves, there could be jewelry or other artifacts that might reveal them. No stone unturned, huh? Man, I'm finding nothing. The signs of remains, bones, anything. We pretty much can rule out plague and famine. I mean, we're so close to the coastline, all this lush landscape, there's no way people died of famine. No. And if it was a plague, if people died, there'd be remains. Absolutely, you'd see something. Hey, guys! What do you got? Just noticed something on the ground, so I started poking around over here. You seeing this? Yeah. I mean, look at these. These are definitely been placed here in a circle. This could mean something. Ken has found a small ring of stones. It's unclear whether its function was ceremonial or survivalist. I mean, it just kind of looks like a fire pit to me. You got potential squatters and maybe even residences here. Can we just dig this up a little bit and see what's underneath? All right, we can do that. What do you got there, Tommy? Yeah, it's been buried a long time. Definitely looks like a vertebrae, doesn't it? Yeah, those are bones. For no sure. No doubt about it. Looks like a fish to me. I know from my research that stone circles have a lot of significance. The Inuit people would make sacrificial offerings to some of their spirits. Well, I don't know if this is just a, a meal or part of an offering. Yeah, it's hard to say. Sacrificial offerings are a part of virtually every known religion, grounded in the principle of bringing the best of one's bounty to the deity that provided it. But anything less could draw the god's wrath. Could these fish bones represent a sacrifice to the bear god Torngasuk, 
ruler of the sea. And could they be from the time when the village was still populated? Fish is the offering of a choice to the Torngasuk. So my theory may have some validity. Perhaps this bear spirit found this offering was not substantial enough, and so it you know, drove the people out of this area. Well, whatever happened, we need to bag it up and keep moving. Well, we're definitely not going to know what it is until we get it analyzed, so let's get to the lab and keep moving. My guess is that someone passing through here recently took a break and cooked a fish. Hopefully, a forensics analysis can tell us for sure. Let's see what else we can find. As the day winds down with no more evidence found, the team heads back to the shore to meet up with the boat for a ride back to the mainland. Well, I'm excited to find out what these bones are. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, guys, we got some building material here. Look at that. Tommy, you think that just drifted in, or it could be from the village? Oh, I think it absolutely drifted in. It's all rounded. It's been on the beach for a long time. Hmm. Could have been a cabin or part of a dock. It's a barnacle or something. Yeah, yeah buried in there. It's on a rock. You can. Check that out. What is this? Well, that's not driftwood. What do you think could have done that? What's that from? It's old. Some that's of the sure. planking on a, on a boat. Let me see that. That could be interpreted as teeth marks, right? I see what you're Look looking at. That guy. Tommy, what do you think? I don't know. All right, well, if that is a bite, then what could possibly make a bite that large? Nothing that I know of. Maybe it's not a bite mark. The idea of an animal attacking a boat doesn't make sense. Most animals will swim away before risking that kind of confrontation. But I have to admit, that missing chunk does look a lot like a bite mark. I know it's bigger than a sea lion can do. How about a shark? Salmon shark? Salmon shark's not going to bite through this thick of plank. I mean, guys, this opens up a whole nother mystery. Mm -hmm. I'm not qualified to make a determination as to what this is, so I think we need to get this in the hands of an expert. The interior of Alaska has vast stretches unexplored by modern man. What unknown creatures might be lurking in this enormous expanse? And could they be contributing to the large number of people that go missing here? A northern legend of a massive bear god called Torngasuk seems to be based on a real animal, the polar bear. But polar bears don't exist in the southern part of the state where a sighting tied this legend to a vanished village. One possibility is that the witness saw a Kermode bear, a black bear with a recessive gene that turns 10% of its population white. This has earned it the nickname Spirit Bear. The problem is, Kermode bears are a small species, too small to match the testimony, and far too small to drive away an entire village of natives. The team found some fish bones at the site and a strangely damaged board that they hope will shed light on the mystery. Ken and Tommy visit the zoo to meet with Tim Bertram, an animal expert who's examined their evidence. Come on in. Hey, Tim. Hey. It's my friend Tommy. Good, man. Tommy, Good nice to meet you. Hi. What do we got? I got your results in, and what we have here is a large flatfish. So I did have them run some tests, and the DNA sample came back that it is a halibut. Well, can you tell us anything about the age? Unfortunately, carbon dating of uh, bones of this nature has a wide margin of error. You couldn't really tell the difference between a 10-year-old bone and a 50-year-old bone. My best guess is it's been weathered and buried for a few decades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Halibut has always been a prized food fish in southern Alaska. So there's a good chance it was just somebody's meal. Without knowing the age of the bones, we can't assume that it was any sort of offering. So Tim, what about the board we found? I mean, those look like bite marks. Is there any chance that those could have been made by some kind of sea creature or maybe even a bear? It's interesting because they do look like bite marks and they do look like they're puncture wounds from the canine teeth of a large carnivore. The combination of canines and incisors makes it likely that it would be from a, a mammal and not from a fish. It could be sea lions. They have very similar dentition to the bears. Uh, wolves also have similar dentition. However, what really strikes me is the distance between the two canines. The canine teeth on an adult polar bear are on average about three inches apart. Hmm. Your board actually has a gap of five inches. Uh, that's a little less than double the size. Could this bear be twice the size as normal? 
Uh, well, if you multiply the distance across the canine teeth and uh, extrapolate that, that would indicate a bear that was perhaps eight times the normal size of adult bears today in Alaska. The size difference of the bite mark is only across one dimension, width. If the difference were multiplied across all three dimensions, it would suggest a bear of unbelievable proportions. Well, that's biologically impossible, right, Tim? I mean, not gonna the see bear that, would yeah. collapse onto itself. Right. I would agree. This could be an anomaly. It could perhaps be a bear with a disfigured jaw or something mm. of that nature, or it could be from a completely different animal. There are extinct bears that do have larger sizes than today's bears. The short-faced bear is uh, an example of a Pleistocene bear that grew to extreme sizes, larger than today's biggest polar bears and biggest Kodiak bears. It also had a different dentition than those bears that had shorter jaws, and they were very powerful, very muscular. The giant short-faced bear was a colossal specimen that once roamed the Alaskan wilderness. This enormous animal could stand 12 feet tall, and its larger legs enabled it to run at speeds up to 40 miles per hour. Its short, compressed muzzle gave it a wider spread of teeth, similar to the mark on the wood. But all signs are that this bear went extinct about 20,000 years ago. Could there be a surviving strain living in the wilds of Alaska? Was there any DNA on the sample, or? Uh, no, we weren't able to get any DNA off that sample. OK. Well, Tim, this has been great information. Thanks again for your time. I always appreciate it. On a quest to find a more modern incident that might tie into the bear god legend, Jax heads to a local dock. He's been told that one of the captains knows all the stories that have taken place in the nearby waters. Hey, Captain Mike. Oh, hey, how are you? Hey, I'm Jax. Oh, good. Nice to meet you. Oh, pleasure to meet you. Hey, I won't take a whole lot of your time. I just got a little interesting question to ask you. My friends and I, we were out on Hitchbrook Island, and we found a piece of shipwrecked wood that has got what appears to be a bite mark out of it. Have you ever heard of any strange encounters near Hinchinbrook involving animal attacks? I do know a guy that, I don't know, seven or eight years ago had a bad experience out in the sound. He was out fishing in that same area around Hinchinbrook. And uh, something hit the boat. And he sees this massive white paw just grabbing the boat and tried to get away real quick. But by the time you look again, there's just a little swish in the water where something was there. When you say paw, you're referring to a bear paw, right? Well, he didn't know what it was, but he, he described it like a bear paw. And that was all he saw? That's all he saw. So something would have to be pretty big to It'd have to be pretty substantial. Awesome. Yeah. Huh. So did you believe the guy? Well, uh, I don't know him that well. But he seems like a stand-up guy. Yeah. And uh, just from the look and the terror on his face when he told me the story, All right. I believe he saw something. Well, you think you can show me on a map where it was? Yeah, you bet. He said it's right outside the Cordova Harbor here. OK. And what was our distance from, from the harbor? Well, from the north end of Hinchinbrook, it's right at 25 miles. Hmm. I don't know if that fisherman actually saw a bear. But bears are territorial, and this happened in the same basic territory as the village. So maybe there's something to this. Each year in the Alaska Triangle, thousands of people are reported missing. In most cases, it's one or two people at a time who disappear into this vast wilderness. But what could have caused an entire village to vanish? Sightings of a large white bear have called to mind the Torngasuk, a bear god of northern folklore. Could this metaphysical being be active down here? Or is there a more tangible animal on the prowl? The team starts prepping for an overnight stakeout. While Tommy secures a bear trap, Jax and Ken meet with some bear survival experts. This is the place, man. Just in case there's a real bear out there. Hey, guys. Hey, how, hey, you how you doing? Going, man? Hey, how's it going, I'm man? Jax. Ken? Jax Brian Clint, Clint, man. Nice to meet you, Clint. Yeah. So what are you guys doing here in Alaska? Well, we're on an investigation that we think possibly might be dealing with an exceptionally large bear. So do you guys want to capture or kill this 
animal. Capture it, first okay. off, so we can continue our investigation. But the whole idea is to not die. <laughs> so That's the most important one, for sure. So I guess the question I would ask you guys, what is your experience with, with firearms? Uh, we're going to be using a tranquilizer gun out there. Um, but I always carry a sidearm. When we meet people with firearms, we try to shy away from depending on ballistics. Let's go over here. Yep. One point we want to make about uh, using the firearm. Clint, can I have uh, one of those to work with right there, OK? When an individual is in this position and they're defending themselves from a bear attack, if they m miss the bear, they're in a, almost one of the worst positions for an attack. And the person now goes back on their back, and this is now all open to attack. Mm -hmm. and that's why we like spray, because it's an all-encompassing wall of pepper and, you know, and, and a deterrence. Do you want us to show you some bear spray? Absolutely. That yeah, would be we've awesome. Got, yeah, we've got, we got a lot of bear spray here at the school. I am confident in my shooting abilities, but I know short-range handgun shots can miss or be ineffective. So it's good to practice another option. First things first, grab both hands. Go ahead and aim at your target. And you want to have it high, your hands a little bit higher, right about there, good. And then what I want you to do is simply take your thumb, put it forward, and pull that safety off. There you go, excellent. Now this is, your safety is off and you're ready to fire. Your thumb is going to go right on this black lever, and let's go ahead and see what that feels like. And go. go, go. Keep spraying, keep, keep spraying. spraying. Keep spraying. Bring it down slightly. Bring it down. Yeah, there you go. It, it. Good. Good. Keep going, Ken. Keep going. Dump yeah, that and thing. And turn. Good job. There it Excellently. That's how it goes. Safety's back on. Yeah. Using this bear spray seems easy, but if there's an 800 pound bear coming at me, that's going to be some pressure. I can see how you could struggle with the safety or miss the trigger. And if this bear is multiple times normal size, then even a perfect shot might not stop it completely. The possibility of a monstrous bear is more than a theory to Paul Vardell, who had a strange experience near Cordova in 2010. So I was doing this Saturday hike near the coast, and the path is kind of up in the woods, and it gets a pretty decent breeze in the summertime. As I was hiking along, I smell this, like, briny ocean smell, which would have made sense closer to the water, but this far up, it just, it seemed off to me. I didn't think much of it. I kept hiking. I come around this corner in the trail, and up ahead, there's this rock outcropping. And just over the outcropping, I can see the back of what has to be this just huge animal. And the first thing that came to my mind was polar bear, because it was, it was white which makes no sense. There's no way a polar bear would be this far south, and even a polar bear is not going to be that big. And before I really registered what I was seeing, I hit this low, deep, like, rumbling growl. And whatever it was dropped down below the rocks. I just froze, and I sat there for like two or three full minutes. Eventually, I convinced myself to kind of walk up around and see uh, if I could see what this thing was, and by the time I got up around the rocks, it was gone. There was nothing there. But in the ground, there were these huge paw prints, like two or three times the size of a normal bear paw print. I didn't stick around to find out what it was. Uh, I got out of there, because anything that big would eat me whole. Armed as well as they can be, the team heads back toward Hinchinbrook Island to do an overnight stakeout. They brought bait to go with the trap Tommy's procured. It'll be set up as an offering to the bear god, while also serving as a lure for any real bears. Well, we're going to set the trap up, up near a tree, because we have to have an, uh, an anchor to attach it to so it doesn't get away. Extreme caution out there, because, you know, you step into that trap, it'll snap your leg right off. It's just, it's got teeth on it. All right, well, sounds like we got all the bases covered. Yeah. And I can't think of anything else. Hey, guys. What's up? You your binoculars? Look at that tree cropping right there. Where? There? Yeah, that, that, that cropping that the trees right there. Something, something very large and white. I don't see anything. I don't know if the story is getting to me, but I'm convinced I saw some sort of big white creature out there in the woods. We have to get there immediately. Hey guys. 
crap. Look at that tree cropping right there. Something very large and white. Whatever it is is in the trees now. I don't know if the story is getting to me, but I'm convinced I saw some sort of big white creature out there in the woods. We have to get there immediately. The team makes their way toward the tree line. They know it's only been two weeks since a hunter reported seeing a huge white bear here, so they have to be cautious. Hey, guys, I think I last saw it up this way. Guys, I saw it right in this area. What's that? Hold on, Tom. Oh, yeah. See the track? Huh. Think that's a bear track? I'm see vaguely seeing some toes up there. This is more of a heel pad back here. I don't think it's a brown bear, because you definitely would see claw marks up there. This track is smeared. I know that the, the pads of polar bear feet contain lots of tiny uh, papillae. They help to create friction between the foot and the ice. Obviously, the track is too compromised to see if it had those. Polar bears have smaller, stubbier claws, more, more pulled back. Considering how fast this thing, whatever it was, disappeared, completely vanished, I don't think we can rule out something supernatural here. Well, guys, I believe I saw something here, so I think I need to set up a stakeout. Let's right, find a good spot for me to be in this area. Yeah. Splitting up for the night will maximize our chances for seeing what's out here. It sounds risky, but we've had our bear defense training, so it's worth the gamble. Up here, guys, there's a clearing up here. Yeah, I think this is a good spot, guys. Great vantage point, I got a good point, vantage man. right here. Yeah. I can stay in contact with you guys with the radio, and you guys can head up to the village. Sounds track. good. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. We'll check in in a few minutes. The team leaves enough gear for Jax to set up an overnight stakeout in the woods. He pitches a tent and will log his time here on a video camera. Ken and Tommy arrive at the village and set up the bear trap at the stone circle, which they can watch from nearby structures. What are we doing here, Tommy? What's this for? Making a little tripod to hold the bait. Nice rockfish. Tommy places a camera next to the bait. Looks like it's set, Ken. Let's go to the cabin, huh? It will provide a live feed to their laptop allowing them to get an up-close look at anything that approaches the trap. Preparing for this stakeout is unnerving. I mean, if there's an oversized bear out there, I've got to wonder if a tranquilizer gun and bear spray are going to be enough. And if it's a bear god, we might suffer the same fate as the former residents of this village. The possibility of a massive bear on Hinchinbrook Island is not unprecedented. The test case is just down the Gulf of Alaska on Kodiak Island home of the largest brown bears in the world. Kodiak bears were cut off from the rest of their species during the last ice age 12,000 years ago. Oftentimes, an isolated population of large carnivores evolves smaller due to limited resources. But the abundance of salmon on Kodiak, coupled with the lack of competition, had the opposite effect. Could a similar situation on Hinchinbrook have caused the same result for a population of white bears. Longtime Alaskan resident and pilot Noah Silver believes so, based on something he saw while flying over Hinchinbrook in 2004. I've lived in Alaska my whole life, and I fly my plane to get around. One night, I was flying through some dense fog and decided I needed to get down so that I could not just rely on instrument navigation. As I pulled into the clear along the shoreline, I noticed a huge creature, a giant, really. It looked like a polar bear, except for three or four times as big, maybe 10 feet or more at the shoulder. I turned around to get a better look, but by the time I doubled back, it was gone. I once heard of a legend of a giant bear, and. And to me now, it's not a legend. It's, it's real. Several hours into the stakeout, the team has yet to see or hear anything unusual. Jack scans the surrounding woods with a thermal imager, looking for any heat traces that indicate a life form. 
No signs of scat or broken branches. The foliage is very dense. I think if there was a bit large bear here, there'd be a lot more broken branches. Hey, Ken, you see anything? Nothing yet, brother. Nothing. Grab the thermal camera and have a look outside here. Keep an eye on our trap out there. Good idea. It's a little surprising to me that we haven't seen anything so far. That fish is a tempting food source. I mean, I would think that something would have at least checked it out. All right, it's 0247 hours. I've completed my thermal imaging around the camp. I've seen no signs of bear or any knockdown branches or signs of scat. Temperatures have really dropped, and it's raining. Trying to warm up here in the tent for a little bit. Hey, Tommy. Yeah, Jax. Real cold and real quiet. How about you guys? Yeah, same here. We're not reading anything. All right, we might be in for a long one. Long one, yes, indeed. You heard that? I heard that. I think it came from the direction of Jax's camp. Here, I'll give him a shout. No, no, no. Don't call him. You could potentially bring something to him, you know what I mean? If they hear the walking go off. Gotcha, gotcha. Should we go down there? We should. Lights on. If the team is hearing a bear, it's a frightening concern. Bears prefer to steer clear of humans. If it's coming close, it could be on the hunt and viewing them as prey. Jax! What do you got, man? I don't know. Definitely like a low guttural growl sound. I couldn't tell what direction it came from. It sounded like it was coming from your direction. That's why we come over. I've done a couple 360 sweeps all the way through camp, but I didn't see anything. I know I heard something, but there hasn't been a sound since I got outside the tent. If an ammo were still around, the thermal would have picked it up. Whatever made that noise, it must have been heading somewhere else. I think we need to get back to you guys' trap. Let's get up and see what's happening there. Well, traps still there, baits there, trail cam. Yep, trail cam's clean. No pictures. Everything's undisturbed. This is really disappointing. The night's nearly over, and we have nothing to show for our stakeout. We need to regroup and see if there's any final play we can make in the time that we have left. Guys, we'll head back to your cabin. Well, if there was a bear in the area, it would have definitely gone for that fish. Sure enough, you, you know they're smelling it. Well, unless it was smart and knew it was a trap. So you're acknowledging that we could be dealing with something supernatural, that maybe the Toingasuk could be a real thing? At this point, I don't know what to believe. What the crap, guys? What happened? <laughs> you guys all over the place. We did not leave it like this, man. This has obviously been ransacked. Man, I am convinced someone is on this island messing with us. Start accounting for our gear, man. There's a lot of expensive stuff here. Here's my night vision. Computer. Computer's still there. 
Our bag was just totally ripped wide open. Flipped over. I've got K2, I've got GPS, call blaster. All the food's gone. All right, well, bears are notorious food thieves, right? So are humans. But if we're humans, you know, look at all our expensive equipments here. Hey, it's pretty damp out there, man. There would be, like, footprints or something. Huh. Whatever came in here didn't leave us any identifying evidence. So could this have been some kind of metaphysical being, maybe sending us a message? You know, guys, think about it. <sighs> maybe this was the torn gasuk. I mean, maybe this is some kind of warning. By taking our food, it's trying to tell us what? Get out of here, you have no more food, you can't survive, something like that? <sighs> All right. I don't feel safe. I'm gonna pack up my gear. Whatever's in here obviously knows we're here. I don't see any evidence of who, who came in here. The team decides to collect their gear so they can spend the rest of the stakeout at Jax's tent. They'll be safer as a group if anyone or anything comes looking for more contraband. Let's get rolling. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, Ken, check this out. Look at that, Jax. What is that? What's that white, fuzzy stuff up there? That's hair. The Alaska Triangle is known for the large number of people who go missing here. But what could make the population of an entire village vanish? Could the Torngasuk, a god in the form of a giant white bear, have driven the villagers away or destroyed them completely? The team was hoping to find evidence of this legendary figure or of any real bear that could have inspired it. Get rolling. And they just found an intriguing clue. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, Ken, check this out. Look at that, Jax. What is that? It's that white, fuzzy stuff up there. That's hair. Or fur or something, man. Is it, is it like cotton or wood? OK, well, what are we looking at in terms of indigenous animals here? Doll sheep. That's way too tall for that. Mountain goat. Same thing. It's way yeah. too, up there way too high. Maybe this is your polar bear here, Jax. We haven't found any biological evidence at all, so this is kind of exciting. The lab can check this out for us. Tell me you got that paper bag. I don't know if this hair is connected to whatever stole our food, but it is tangible evidence of something that was in this structure once, and we need to find out what it is. I can't identify that. Tommy, you've worked with polar bear fur. Does that look anything like it? No. Polar bear fur is a lot coarser, um, thicker, and translucent. This is not translucent at all. It's a common misperception that polar bear fur is white. Each hair is actually colorless, with a hollow core that reflects and scatters light in a way that creates the illusion of whiteness. The same phenomenon is at play with snow, each flake is composed of ice crystals, which are translucent. But in aggregate, they appear white. What that means is, if this hair is from a bear, it's not a typical polar bear. Well, we got a whole bunch of it, whatever it is. Well, let's get that off to be analyzed. The team heads for Jax's tent to finish their stakeout. But the rest of the night remains uneventful. Two days later, they reconvene in town to discuss the results of the lab test. Hey, gentlemen, how we doing? Good. All right. Well, I got something for you. I was honestly kind of nervous, because as you know, with hair samples, it's kind of hit and miss. But it turns out that the hair is human. Human? Yeah. Now, the sample is highly degraded. It's decades old. Huh. I think the likely reality is that the hair belonged to someone who lived in the village, you know, before everyone vanished. That old, huh? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of makes sense, though. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they're thinking. Now, obviously, it didn't match anybody in their database, so. Of course not from a sample that old. 
Yeah, I wouldn't expect someone from a fishing village to be inside any DNA website. Well, well, this proves that this hair doesn't belong to a polar bear. But we have other clues we still can't explain. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, consider the, the smeared footprint that we found and that enormous bite out of the board, that suggests a bear with a deformed jaw or a bear of potentially extraordinary size. It kind of fits the mold of the torn gasuk. You know, consider a spirit, a spirit who can temper his wrath. And, you know, essentially he was giving us a, a warning. He was a protector. Mm -hmm. So rather than attacking us, he was, you know, basically just telling us to get out of there, so. So which is it? An exceptional bear or, like you're saying, maybe a bear spirit? The team is unable to prove the existence of a physical being that would explain these bizarre bear sightings. Could such a creature exist? Genetic differentiation does show that white bears can be found in non-polar regions, but would a purely physical bear, no matter how large, be enough to frighten off an entire native community? Sightings indicate something is behind the Torngasuk legend. Whether it's an animal or a god, its existence could be one more reason. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, Ken, check this out. People continue to go missing in Alaska.